I'm David Gutkin. I'm a fellow here at the Columbia Society of Fellows in the Humanities. Uh, before that, I was a graduate student in the musicology department here at Columbia. Right now, I'm writing a book called New York Avant-Garde Opera in the Historical Imagination, 1968 to 1994. Uh, very broadly, the book is about how American opera underwent all sorts of experiments in its form in the late 20th century, uh, and how these experiments drew upon uh, contemporaneous debates about historical consciousness and national identity. There is this kind of incredible uh, uh, burst of interest in the idea of opera beginning in the 70s and kind of uh, flowering in the 1980s, uh, specifically in New York City and uh, on the part of a lot of experimental and avant-garde musicians and composers. There is a kind of story about this, uh, and it usually centers upon a couple figures, notably Philip Glass, uh, um, and this is seen as the sort of part of the operatic uh, efflorescence. Um, I guess looking into this, I started to discover that in fact there was a much richer array of operatic uh, activities going on in New York in the 70s and 80s, uh, and so I want to tell that story. Specifically, I discovered that there's many, many uh, experimental jazz musicians who were working on operas uh, in, in the 70s and 80s, uh, Anthony Braxton, uh, Anthony Davis. Uh, there's a group called the Harlem Opera Ensemble, who had initially been, uh, they were a group that performed uh, traditional operas beginning in the uh, late 50s and early 60s. At some point in the late 60s, they sort of came under fire by the uh, black cultural nationalists. They were told that they were selling out by being opera singers, and they actually took it to heart and started collaborating with free jazz musicians to come up with a kind of new improvised form of opera in Harlem and elsewhere in New York. So I'm writing about uh, these guys that were working with the musician Sam Rivers. One of the things that interested me most is that the word opera was being held onto even while the form was getting sort of obliterated. Uh, but there also was this kind of countervailing, uh, um, this kind of countervailing movement in which formerly avant-garde musicians started writing actually quite traditional operas. So I'm looking at this and a whole navigation of the idea of opera uh, in this period. So I'm also writing an article called The Modernities of H. Lawrence Freeman uh, about an African-American opera composer who was born in 1869 in Cleveland, eventually in the 1910s moved to Harlem and has been, was based in Harlem until his death in the 50s. Uh, this project actually emerged out of my dissertation research in a kind of funny way, so I was writing a dissertation that closely uh, resembles uh, my book project uh, about avant-garde opera since the 70s, but I was looking specifically into the history of jazz and opera intersections, and somehow through that I uh, followed back this history of jazz opera entwinements uh, to the Harlem Renaissance and to this composer H. Lawrence Freeman, whose papers were recently acquired by the Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Columbia, and basically I became so fascinated by uh, this composer's work that I ended up writing a, I don't know, a huge 80 page chapter, it sort of almost ruined the coherence of my dissertation because it started being a project about jazz and opera going back to the 1920s. I discovered that he had a fascinating, never performed uh, so-called jazz opera called American Romance. Uh, and then I realized that no one had actually written hardly anything about this composer at all. Uh, so I became very involved in just researching his entire archives. The woman who had initially archived his work at Columbia's library is a member of a group called the Morningside uh, Opera, and she decided to actually restage uh, H. Lawrence Freeman's opera called Voodoo. It hadn't been performed since 1928, so just this last summer, um, Columbia University and Miller Theatre put on two sold-out performances of Voodoo, and I helped to organize a conference about uh, performing arts during the Harlem Renaissance, sort of focused on H. Lawrence Freeman. I've been in the Society of Fellows now only for a few months, uh, but it's been a really wonderful experience so far. It keeps you on your toes. So every Thursday uh, for this last semester, uh, my colleagues have shared their work, I've shared some of my work, uh, and you know, we have to help each other, we have to come up with things to say about each other's work, and they work on things that are obviously very different than me. You know, I have a, a colleague who writes about sheep reading in the 19th century, a colleague who writes about religion and pilgrimage in ancient Rome, uh, about contract labor law and immigration in the 19th century uh, in the United States, all sorts of things that are very far from what I do, and uh, I enjoy the challenge of you know, trying to think how I could actually be helpful uh, to them. Stopping the terrible process of specialization, which can really affect you in academia, I guess. You, know, you just get so into the nitty-gritty of your work and you forget what the big issues are. This semester I'm teaching a class called Music Humanities. It's part of Columbia University's core curriculum. What I especially like about teaching it is that we're given 
the instructor is a great deal of leeway in how we assemble it. And so I don't use a textbook, I use a book of source readings. We read a lot of quite, I think, heady musicological literature. My class this semester has been uh, a, a particular joy to teach. There have been some very sensitive students with wonderful musical uh, imaginations and ears. Uh, I have some mathematicians who really latched on to some of the more kind of intricate modernist music, the 12-tone serial music that we've been studying. and. Sometimes, you know, as a musicologist, there's a kind of joke that we stop listening to music or we stop liking music, you know, because it becomes our job. And I find that when I teach music home, I always have to just sit down and listen to all sorts of things that I probably haven't listened to, you know, for years and, and actually appreciate them again. Next semester, I'm developing uh, my own course, New York City Avant-Garde Music and Performance since 1950. So we'll just be looking at all sorts of things that were happening in the incredibly fertile uh, New York City music and performance scene.